Good morning and welcome to this next in the series of the webinars presented by Effect Tech. My name is Paul Buffington. I'm going to be your host in the next 60 minutes. And today's topic, we're looking at improving IT service management with real-time operational data insights. And these data insights are provided by Splunk. We're working with numerous customers to implement Splunk around IT operations and improve both uh, real t uh, you know, supporting their critical applications as well as lowering MTTR. And that's going to be the focus of today's webinar. So let's just get to the agenda and get started. So we'll just start out first here by considering the challenges that service support organizations face. And oftentimes these are related to data gaps that they have, just lack of insights when they have a SEV1 or SEV2 incident come in. So we'll just try and understand some of those uh, challenges and relate them to our topic today. And then I want to get right to what is Splunk after we've gone through and uh, looked at a couple of different use cases. And we're going to look at this uh, search platform. And if you haven't seen it before, this is a great start, uh, place to start for understanding what Splunk is capable of doing. And it's a search platform for what we call machine data. So we're going to look at its capability of how it collects and indexes and allows you to take that data and turn it into what we call uh, actionable insights or operational intelligence. We'll actually look at how we can leverage Splunk to troubleshoot problems and investigations. And that's where we're going to be focused on in a real uh, live demo from an environment. And we'll go through a uh, use case of application management. Finally, we'll, we'll wrap up and look at some areas where you can connect us to your IT service management uh, application. In the, in the use case today, we'll be focused on the Remedy ITSM product suite, but this can be applied to no matter what your service desk is, whether it's uh, Remedy, ServiceNow, HP, CA, or even just your, your own homegrown application, it's very easy to, to connect Splunk, uh, allowing those supported um, service agents, whether you're tier one or tier two, to quickly get to the information they need to get to a fast resolution of an incident. And I will go through a Q&A. This uh, is a recorded session that was presented earlier, and I'm going to go through the list of questions that were actually offered up. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's look at and just think about your current IT infrastructure. Today's infrastructure is quite overwhelming and complex. In addition to the numerous technology and devices, we have all of the different layered uh, aspects of this, whether it's around the applications and the way they're layered out or just the overall data center and um, ultimately looking to deliver back the business service. And then add on top of that the virtualization and cloud computing. So IT's job has not gotten much, it hasn't gotten any easier. And so that's why the, the data insights are really critical. And so I kind of want to just start with a question for you to consider. Think about your most recent incidents that have taken a long time to resolve. Consider those top tier applications that your team is supporting. And ask yourself this question, do they have the real time data insights that they need to quickly resolve incidents? Now, keep that question in mind as we move along here. Oftentimes, it's very difficult, and that, that answer to that question sometimes is no, they don't. That's why these incidents take a long time to resolve. So not even, when I say time, not at hours, but sometimes even days, and we'll look at an example of that. It's because of the complex silo-based technologies, and the experts for those technologies are oftentimes they're in those silos. That's their focus. The DBA is focused on the DBA layer and the app tier is a different you know, set of programmers or system administrators. And so we, we face that challenge of you know, breaking down those silos. Oftentimes, service support teams don't have access to this data because it's on a production system and they can't go to it or they're not an expert and they would you know, open up those log files. So they have to ask someone else to open them up. So we're looking at disconnected and, and oftentimes outdated you know, areas of point solutions. Uh, I'm a monitoring tool that's maybe looking at one layer, but it's just at a certain aspect of data, when really what they need is to consider all layers of the data across the data center for your critical applications. Oftentimes, the root cause analysis that's going on is related to frequent changes that occur. And that's, you know, we can look at a change request, but where did it impact and across those different aspects of the data? And what we're looking to do is reduce the mean time to resolution. The mean time to resolution is quite high oftentimes because of the, inve the investigation is going through the weeds of this needle in the haystack, trying to find what it is that caused this issue. So let's look at an example. And I use the um, term mean time to re resolution that MTTR, uh, oftentimes managers have a report in that. They're looking at a measuring that. 
Well, we have found that it typically runs fairly high. And so in this example here, we break mean time to resolution down into the different categories. And this comes from Gartner, how they look at a service desk agent and how they analyze an incident. And it begins right up front with the mean time to identification, whether someone's called me on the phone to report an issue or it's come through some sort of monitoring tool, that incident has been created. And what we have found, and Gartner found this in, the, in all of the investigation and the research on this, is that 70% of MTTR is spent in the meantime to know that investigation and diagnosis is the longest aspect of this cycle. The reason for that quite often is because of the different data points, the resources involved, the SWAT calls for hours on end sometimes. And then we have the remaining part of this, that mean time to fix and the mean time to verify. So we'll come back to this a little bit later on after we consider Splunk, but I want to use an example here. This actually comes from a customer example where people soft accounts payable batch job was excessively long and completing. And they were, it took over 15, almost 16 days to resolve this. And as we went through and we looked at the audit history of this, the ticket was being transferred around. There were numerous calls, having people check different log files. And so, it's very lengthy in that case because they did not have the actual data they need to make the right decision. They knew what. The what was PeopleSoft batch jobs were um, getting hung up on the system, but they didn't know why. So we're going to look at how do we actually bring this down. Now, in typical service desk and implementations, and I'll just use Remedy as an example here, we do have some data insights that are valuable to us from the reporting of the incident. When it's identified and recorded, oftentimes we'll know which service and CI it is impacting. So those are quite often related to the incident. So that's really valuable of having that and having that service context for the incident. However, it's not easy to determine if it's a casual CI that's reported or the possibility that what's the impact of this because the data that's coming into the seam to be is only as fresh maybe of a couple days ago. And I'm missing that actionable operational data that happened within the, you know, the window of time that this incident occurred. Now we could sometimes drill down into the actual CI within the service model. Again, really valuable. I understand its context. I've narrowed my scope. I think it's PeopleSoft. So I'm able to put some context around it. But again, the freshest of this data is measured more in days than in hours. Let's say this incident was reported in the last couple hours. How do I go and you know go through all of that data? I may have to call someone up, have them check the log files. And is it potentially not, is it we certain it's the PeopleSoft app? Or is it some layer down under, you know, network or database layer? So the CDV alone doesn't really lend itself to MTTR reduction. Let's just go ahead and take a second in the trenches for the service desk agent that's taken this call. So they've they received a call, people soft performance issue, batch jobs are getting hung up, and they, they look through what they may have. They may have, you know, they'll check the PeopleSoft application or they have maybe some dashboards. You know, if it's not PeopleSoft, it's uh, another application that's critical to the business. And they will be able to look at some initial dashboards and consoles, and they all look green. So the next thing they're going to do is they're going to escalate the ticket. They're going to call application support, and they're going to check some Java monitoring tools, some lower level tools that tier one agent may not have access to. And that means that they now have to call the developer because they're not seeing anything either there, but there's still a known issue because multiple people may have reported this. So the next aspect is when they call the application developer, they have to actually stop what they're working on. So they might be working on some new code and they need the production logs. Well, they don't have access to production. So then we go ahead and call up the sysadmin. And I had the system, the system administrator make this reference the other day that they're more of a data butler than they are a systems administrator. And that's true in some cases that they're spending more time serving up, you know, log files to the developers than actually focus on their day-to-day -day job. So they, they gather up all the information and they respond to that and send it back to the application developer. They then start going through line by line. And this may have actually evolved into a SWAT call with the application support team. So you might have multiple people on the call now looking through line by line of this code, making certain, okay, where's this issue? Where's the bottleneck? What's causing this? And they, they finally find something. What they think 
possibly might be causing this. And so they call the DBA and have now the DBA is on the SWAT call asking them to look at their audit, audit logs because they're looking at slow query performance. But at the end of the day, the what is still not really at the why. And look at the time that has evolved here. And this is just a matter of hours. In some cases for these sub what instances that I've seen in some systems and reports, we're talking about days on these. And this is critical downtime that's impacting the business. It can be very costly. Now think about the data that these folks are dependent upon that they're wanting to get insight into. This data is out on the production system. This is what we call machine data that's being generated, whether it's the top tier order processing in this example or a middleware app that's you know processing these transactions to the web server that's hosting this, to ultimately the backend database, and even potentially customers calling in and, and reporting issues on a, a call service. So all of this data, we have experts that know the data and it's being generated out, but I, I have no way of connecting across there. But you know, think about this for a second, the valuable information in here. I know, you know what, who, who is interacting with it, the errors that are occurring, uh, how they're interacting with it in the relationship. There's correlation within this data that's really valuable insights. But for me to put this together, I, mean, I would never attempt this, you know, take the log files, mash them up and try and go through it. It's just humanly, it's really difficult because of the amount of time that would be involved. And by the time I would collect up these log files and look at them, it may have been, it may have already been overwritten. The middleware apps, you know, syslog, it's writing out, and I've lost that data because it's already been overwritten. So really valuable insight inside inside of your uh, log files and you know your data sources that are being generated out of your data center on your critical applications. Now, think about this for a second. What if you could actually search your data center just like the internet. Think about Google. We depend upon Google. I have an error code the other day and I wanted to look it up and I searched for it and sure enough, it was a specific Microsoft error code. The path to fast MTTR is actually trapped just like a needle in a haystack in that data we just looked at. And all I need to do is be able to search that data and be able to bring it all into one searchable location. What if you could actually see a record of the activity and behavior of users? Let's say this is a critical application that I need to support my end users as they interact with it. I'll share an example with this. We have a customer that's implementing Splunk right now, and it's for their doctors and nurses around their uh, Zen desktop that they're running that are providing access into their critical healthcare systems. These applications quite often would hang inside of that Zen desktop environment of these virtual environments would hang up. So the only way that they would find out about these issues is by people calling up saying, this is hung up, this is not working. And they couldn't even be proactive. They were actually finding out after the fact this is occurring. Now with Splunk, they will have visibility as this is occurring, they will receive alerts so they can see user activity as they're connecting to these systems and potentially even resolve these before they connect. They also can see where they received the error and know if an application has failed or if this just is a networking issue. So they can actually quickly resolve where is this at in the stack of the application. What if you weren't bound by the rules of your point monitoring tools? Let's say you have three point monitoring tools that are monitoring various aspects and they only give you a slice of your data. And oftentimes I've heard this from the monitoring team is that, okay, great. This is giving me this aspect of the data, but I really would like to get this additional data that they current monitor tool is not capable of reaching to that because it could be another source or it's just not able to have to be reprogrammed to go ahead and get to that information. What if you actually were able to stitch all of that data together from the, your current mon monitoring tools as well as additional data sources and do what we call true event correlation? And then finally, what if you actually could gain real-time real -time meaningful insight from all of this data from the data center around your critical applications and services that you support. This would be really valuable information and that's where Splunk comes in. And I wanna introduce you to what is Splunk. Splunk is a universal machine data platform that allows us to collect data, whether it's structured or unstructured data from IT generated or business applications, databases, and collect it in real time. And there's no need for parsers or connectors or special programming, just simply collect the data and send it in Splunk. 
that means that we can actually take this data, search it, just like we're searching the internet, searching for specific error codes, as we can see in this example right here, or turn around instead and turn this into actionable live date dashboards that someone at a glance can see, oh, there's an issue here and this is where the spike occurred on the system, or for the manager being able to get an idea of what are the SLAs looking at. And we're going to look at some examples of that, but I think the key thing here is this universal machine data platform makes it very easy to get the data in and make it searchable. Let's drill into a little more details here. What do I mean by collecting this data? Well, we just use a Splunk forwarder. It's a simple collector, no you know, connectors, no parsers, no special programming required. Simply tell me where is the data at? Well, it's on these applications, it's on the database, it's on the different tiers, it's in the different data centers, and send that data to Splunk. And when it does this, it collects it in real time. It knows where it collected it from, what's the source, what's the host, what's the time it collected it at. So it's, it's just tailing these log files, these data sources, and it's writing it to the Splunk index. Now, the Splunk index is not a database. That's what makes it very fast to search. It makes it very pliable. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes where there is no schema. That means I can define what I want to search on at the time of the search. It allows us, as we said, one of the, the core use cases is searching, being able to go in and say, all right, I want to see what's going on on this host in this range of time. I can also monitor and alert. A part of the core platform is out of the box monitoring and alerting on the searches that I create. And I'm not bound by a point solution that's looking at one aspect of the data. I'm looking across potentially multiple sources of data for those issues. Actionable dashboards and reports. Turn any search into a dashboard or a report and serve that up to someone to where they don't have to you know, understand the search language. They can visually have the ability to look at what's going on in that environment, whether it's IT or the business. So search and investigation is where we a lot of our customers commonly start. Being able to just collect all this data up as log aggregation and make it searchable. But immediately you can then turn around and be proactive because you can monitor on specific conditions you want to keep an eye on. Such example is the Zen desktop environment where we're having uh, systems hang up or fail. I can now proactively monitor that where I didn't have that capability prior to that. And ultimately for IT, what we're looking at today is become, turn this around and we have great operational visibility. Gain visibility into those critical applications that you can make those informed decisions when that incident comes in and reduce your MTTR. So what we're going to be looking at today is how do we take Splunk and provide it as a data layer? I often think of Splunk as data fabric. Laying that fabric across our different support processes to find additional improvements and insights that weren't possible before. Now our focus today is the service desk, lowering MTTR, but this is, a, we've done previous webinars and how do we improve change management, configuration management, problem investigations, and the list goes on for IT management. So we're gonna focus on the service desk today and lowering MTTR. So without further ado, let's go ahead and just get right over to the Splunk demo. The environment that I have today is running on Splunk 6, and I'm going to kind of go through the environment, and then we'll go ahead and transition over, and we'll go through the different use cases. So this Splunk environment that's running in the data center today is based on an actual customer implementation. We call it uh, the Splunk Music, uh, Splunk Music Store, Splunk Tel. Um, this was a actual service that a major uh, telecom provider had. They rolled out a brand new music service where it was as much you know the music service you want to use based on your subscription level. And what they were finding was they, were, they had limited insights into the service, both from an IT operation standpoint on the failures, but also on the business side. And that's the other aspect I will, I'll spend some time at the end. So what we have here is we're collecting various types of data. We have the, you know, the transactions coming through the BPM environment. We, and this is actually a, a Splunk search line that's overlaid to this graphic. So this is an idea of some of the visuals that we can create with Splunk and more about the visuals in a few minutes. We can see the CRM application data, the web store data, and then the actual mobile devices connecting their authentication logs and how they're interacting within this case is a music store 
It could be your critical um, application that you've rolled out to your customers, both internal to your business as well as external. Now, what's going on behind the scenes is the Splunk architecture. We've deployed the various forwarders, and the forwarders is just a simple portion of the Splunk code that's placed out there. It's, I, I, I think it was a dumb collector. It's just a collector that says, what data do you want to collect and where do you want to send it to? So a forwarder has been placed out here. We have different data, the, you know, the web tier. Uh, we have remedy ticket data we're, we're pulling in, in this case, because our service desk that, uh, our authentication logs. So we're getting all of this information. We're even reaching into a database and getting out customer account information. And these forwarders are on both Linux-based and Windows-based, and it's sending up to our indexers. And it's, it automatically balances this out. It writes to the indexer. So we have what we call distributed search. So what I'm going to be searching on the search head is searching across multiple indexers to deliver up very fast performance and also potentially if I had an indexer go down, I have all of that data readily available to search. So that's the architecture. Let's go ahead and move on to the next part of that. And that's the next portion and that's the searching. This is core to Splunk. This is one of the a key app. So I'll just I'll come back to this one in a few minutes here. We'll just go ahead and place this back over here. So I'm going to start with this app, the one that's created when you install Splunk. What this allows me to do is begin searching, but I want to kind of uh, just start right here with the data summary. So let's see what kind of data we're collecting. And what this does for me, it allows me to filter or look at, well, these are all the servers in the, this happens to be running in the Splunk data center. These are the different servers that I'm getting data from, as well as the different sources. And we take those sources and we classify them as source types. Now, sources could be multiple directories and they roll up to potentially a source type. Source type becomes really critical in searching and you'll see that in a few minutes. Now, let's go ahead and just go in here and let's see what's happened in the last 60 minutes. So we'll go ahead and start up a search. We'll say 60 minutes. So you just specify your time range. And I'm just gonna put a wild card in here and say, I'll uh, narrow the search down in a few minutes because I want to show you what kind of events it's pulling back. Now, in this six minute, 60 minute window, what we call the flash timeline right here, allows me, if I want to drill in and look at a certain segment of time, let's say I know an issue occurred in this 10 minutes, I can actually zoom into that selection. And what it's done is it's narrowed in and gone into all of those events. And here, are, there's 5,979 events that have occurred in this window of time. Also on the left-hand side, we have some interesting fields. And let me zoom back out. Let's go back out to our main area here. And we have some interesting fields, such as the host, which we just talked about. So where is this data coming from? Um, another one is the source type. And sometimes we can have these fields at the top here. Uh, the source type, so we have our sources, which are the servers that are reporting it in. And also the source type, which we just saw a minute ago. Here it is. So we see all of these. Uh, in these examples here. Now, these fields that we see on the left-hand side, some of these are automatically extracted by Splunk. Others are additional extractions that I add as a Splunk administrator. This is what we, we allow, the, the, this is what allows us to search on. So for example, status. Now these might look familiar to you. These are the status codes reported by a web server, we're able to be able to search on a specific status code. So let's just go and take a look at status 503. So in the last, let's just go ahead and expand out our time range here. Let's go four hours. In the last four hours, we are seeing the 503. Okay, so 503, how many are those are occurring? There's been a couple too many, I would say. I, let me go ahead and back this up here real quick. There we go. Oops, wrong mouse click. So these fields make it possible for us to begin searching the data. And if you recall, there is no database. This is what we call schema on the fly, or I like to re reference late binding schema, meaning that I'm gonna define the structure of what I wanna search on at search time. 
Now, as I said here, and we'll go back to that time range, I, I lost that when I was clicking around there, is that we're seeing some things that I would be a little bit suspicious about. Now, 503, I don't really want any 503 errors, so we would go ahead and maybe further investigate that, but we're getting some spikes of some events here, and we'll get to this in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to actually go through my search investigation. We're going to find out what's causing these, and it's going to be related to an incident we'll be looking at, but let's just spend a little more time with the search language. So let's say you want to look at not just 503 there's some other errors that might occur so i want to look at source type of access so let's go ahead and specify and narrow our search here so source type and you'll notice here the type ahead it's looking at other source types out there so we can look at you know access but i, I want to look at access all of them because there's an access custom and access combined and we're just going to put a wild card on the end and what it's going to do is bring back multiple source types. So if we look down here, our source types would show two of them, access combined and access custom. So I'm looking at authentication and I also want to go ahead and look at the error codes that are occurring. Now 503 was the one we had. Let's go also look at, I want 404 or uh, 500 or let's look at 503. Okay. So now we've brought these back and you'll see that, yeah, the spikes are still there. We'll look at those in a few minutes. Then we're going to go ahead and see that we've narrowed our, our our errors to this. Now, I want to put this into a table. I want to understand some of this data from a table. Instead of having a look at all the actual raw events, I want something that's a little more meaningful to me. So what I can do is I can go ahead and put in the pipe command. And this is, again, schema on the flyer, the late binding schema. I'm going to go ahead and tell me to return some of these fields on the left-hand side in a table. So let's go ahead and put the client IP, because I want to know where they're connecting from. I want to know the action. I want to know the product name. That's another field. And I want to know the status and the method. All right. Great. And so what this is going to do is actually run the search now, and I'm seeing the data, the events, but it's put it into what we call statistics, and it's just simply using the table command, and I'm pulling out the columns or the, the fields from the data. Now, you notice method didn't come back, and that is because that is actually not a field. So if we were to look down here, we'll go ahead and look at the status type. So let's go ahead and pull that one in. And we now see that as the column. So any one of these can be saved off as a report or as a dashboard panel. So let's go ahead and save this as a dashboard panel. And we'll call this uh, web server errors. Uh, I'll just call it my example. Uh, we can do a different statistic with, I'm going to leave it as a, a stats table. We'll deal with more of the graphics in a few minutes and we'll go ahead and keep it private because it's just for me, but I could share this in the app. So we'll go ahead and save that. Oops, what did I forget to do here? Oops, they don't like that. So we'll go ahead and we'll just do underscore. Yes, and I forgot to take out my spaces. It was actually correcting that for me a second ago and I wasn't paying attention to what I was typing. My apologies for that. Okay, so let's go ahead and save this one. And we'll go ahead and just open that up and leave it on another tab because I want to come back to this. So we'll watch the data come in here and now here's my table. So we'll add some additional ones to this in just a second, but let's come back over here and let's change this search up. So let's say that we want to, uh, a couple things I'm seeing here. Uh, I'm seeing some null values. So I want to go ahead and change that. I'm gonna add another pipe in here. Okay, so just, again, this is how easy we're gonna go ahead and do a search. So I'm just gonna do another search. I'm gonna take my original search, I'm gonna search inside of it and I'm going to go ahead and search for action, not null. 
and see what happens. And I've excluded those values that are not null. Now, what else would I want to do? Well, let's say I want to sort on status. So let's go ahead and add that in. So we'll do a sort on, whoops, on, let's sort in ascending. I'm sorry, yeah. There we go. And so now I've changed the search. I like that one, that looks good. And this is often how I develop when I'm in Splunk. I'll have my dashboard on another panel and I'll have my search over here. Let's come over and edit this. Let's change that. So we'll edit the panels. We'll come in here. And now I've saved my search as an embedded search. Let's go ahead and add another one. Let's just do this. Let's add a panel. Um, so we'll call this web server errors. All right, I really like this one. And um, we'll do the last four hours. Okay, and that looks good. And we'll add the panel. Now, this is going to become, and we're going to do this as stats. We're not going to do as any graphic. We'll do a graphic in a few minutes. I like this one over the other one better. So let's just go ahead and remove this one. Now, I wanted to show you, you can quickly move things around. So we'll we'll take this one out since we now have the one we really like. And the benefit here is, you notice this time picker? We can actually change this to now make use of it. So if I want to look at this, I can have it update based on it. And I, one thing I did not do, let's go ahead and do this real quick here. Let's edit our search string. Right here, I want to change that setting to the dashboard. That means now the search time range will come from the dropdown. So really helpful to have that. I've been using that a lot. And this is a, a new feature to Splunk 6. It just makes it much easier to develop and get these out quickly for people to use. All right, we'll come back to this in a minute. Let's go do just a couple more searches and then we'll go ahead and move on to our use case. But I think it's really important that uh, you understand the power of searching your data from Splunk and the flexibility you have. And this is just all a part of the core platform. All right, so let, what about... Um, I want to do another one for source type equals access, but now I want to look at potentially, I want to look at, and I want to use an eval command. So another command that can be used is we're going to do an evaluation, and I want to look at request performance. So I'm going to actually create my own field. So we're going to call it request performance. I want to know how is it performing based on this. And it's actually finding. I typed this in earlier. So I'll, I'll go ahead and select it. And it knows your previous searches. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying request performance to my field equals. And it's going to look and says, all right, if the status is equal to 200, OK, or failed. And I want to go ahead and do an eval on that. And what it's going to do is give me, brings this back as a field now. So where is request performance? Here it is. So now I can look at top values by time, add in the top command of a time chart. So we can look at failed and OK and look how it's doing. So this search now is usable. Let's go ahead and grab that. Come back over to our dashboard. We'll add a new panel, add in our search string. So. And then all I have to simply do, I can change my visual. So the visual here, I think probably is a line chart. Um, there's a couple different ones. I'll just show you some of the other ones you can look at. And, it, and it's interactive too. That's a great thing of Splunk is that I can kind of compare. So that might be helpful. So we'll go ahead and leave that like that. And again, you can move it up here. Now, this dashboard I just created, I could go ahead and send this link to my manager or my you know, IT tier one team saying, here you go, here's the dashboard. It, it, development in Splunk is very fast to allowing you to turn around and give the data back to those that really care about it, that need the insights. And they may not even have to do any searching. And I can drill down saying, oh, what, what's this Apple 12 watt charger? It had a 404 error. And who was, the, you know, what was going on? And I can look at the session ID. So I can go out and look at these issues as they occur for these specific systems. So hopefully you're getting an idea of the power of searching that Splunk has, because now we're going to turn our, our focus back to our use case of that incident that just came in because of an application performance issue. So let's go back. 
So in our environment here, we have some various dashboards, just like I created with Splunk just a few minutes ago. We've created some additional dashboards for different audiences. And the first audience that we want to look at are some dashboards. For, and let me go back over to my Splunk architecture. Are some dashboards for operational visibility. So the IT operations team needs visibility into how this critical application, in this case, the web store for their telecom customers is performing. So how are they doing on their SLAs? One of, one of the other search commands, in, in addition to all of the stats and the eval command, we can look at throughput in a system. Not only a single system, across the entire tier. I can look at, well, when a transaction in, enters on the web tier and moves to the, you know, the application processing tier to the database, what's that transaction time? Am I ex exceeding my SLA? And in this case right now, we are. We're, we're over the threshold. This is fully configurable and based on the searches that you would need. Now, failed transactions, which we were kind of looking at a minute ago with our custom dashboards, it's it's acceptable. I always want to be green line, but it's not quite here. And current capacity, measuring you know how many people are currently logged on on the system. Current, we could even compare against memory and CPU utilage. So we look at com total capacity consumption. It looks all right. Now, the real-time volume, there was just some things going on here that seven day with the transaction, it just dropped off. Something happened in that window of time. My transaction volumes have been dropping off and there's some failures. So something's going on in this window of time that I want to look at. So I don't have to do any searching. I have been able to make a decision here that I need to do further investigation. I don't have to call anyone at this point. No SWAT call. Let's just go down one more layer. And each one of these dashboards, you can control the drill down. I could actually go to the literal results of this data, or I can add, maybe I want to take them to another set of dashboards. So in this case, I want to look at the details of this environment. So at the top, and this is just, again, we're, we're mashing up some you know graphics with this Splunk search, and this is just measuring the average transaction time. So 127 milliseconds, a little bit high. Now, my I know your eyes probably went right over here. There's there's the issue of the database. We don't have to go any further. Let's call the DBA. And we'll, I'll go there in a minute. But I want to show you, if I didn't know that immediately, I could look, okay, what's, what's going on? Well, there's something that occurred on all of the systems at the same time. I'm seeing that hit. And I can look at, well, is it an error code on this tier? Was it the JVM? You know, the it, was it consuming too much memory? Do I have a memory leak? Something going on here? No, it's right here in the database. My database concurrency, I'm looking at something pegged out in this window, and it's right around the same time. So visually, I'm able to quickly get to reassigning this ticket to the database team. My MTTR is cut in half, potentially. I'm able to get right to that team, no call, saying, okay, the web team, I need to go check this. I need my app administrator to look into this. I'm, I'm right on the DBA because there's something going on here. But before I call the DBA, let's take a look. So I, I, again, here's a dashboard example that's to a very specific audience. The DBAs may have their own dashboards. We can build out these dashboards and stitch this all together for, their, for the support team. So what we're seeing here is concurrency occurred and we're seeing query performance just went through the roof. Now, on the bottom of this, we've also brought in for the database server, what's going on for CPU and memory? Because that could be the issue. But in this case here, we're fine. We're not seeing those issues. So it's it's not here. So let's look a little bit further. And we, we've brought in all of the top selected. This is actually a new search in Splunk and Splunk 6. And I'll, I'll open this up in just a minute. But I know where it is right here because I can look at this transaction speed right here. This is all acceptable. This is what's caught here. Uh, tells me what's what's occurred. This is the transaction that's causing this performance issue. I actually can go ahead and you know send this to someone. I can inspect it further. I could actually look at the search. And that's what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to go ahead. Now, the export, by the way, I could send this out as a, you know, a file to someone if they want to look at it, but probably just going to, you know, send sort of notification to them. And we may very well have created a notification around this. We'll get to alerting in a few minutes. So what we're looking at here 
is the actual search. Now this is a new search command that's available to us. And what we're going to see here is we're using, um, looking at the transaction and the average of those transactions as it moves through the environment. So very valuable search and a visual that allows me immediately to get to the issue. So I can call the DBF saying, let's let's get this resolved. Let's get this uh, select statement taken care of. So the MTTR at least but dropped by 40 to 50% in the case of this critical incident. Now, what about potentially of other issues where I don't want to have to go and find it. I want to know about it. So let's look at another example. Let's take a look at uh, in the last four hours. So let's, let's just go out four hours. And I want to look at have I had any crit critical issues, critical database errors? All right. And there they are. So this is also related to this incident. Maybe I'm searching for a specific error code. Um, so is it critical? Is it a specific error code that occurs on a regular basis? I want to go ahead and put that in here. So I just want to show you that a search like this, and it can be a very complex search. Maybe you're going to look for an error that occurs over a certain amount of time, the number of times. So I want to go ahead and capture this. I have no monitoring tool potentially around this data. Well, you do now with Spelunk because I have the ability to come in here and create an alert. So DB Twenty-eight. Okay, so I can put a description. I'm going to run it in real time. I'm going to run on a schedule. So real time, it just I can then. Well, what's going to trigger it? Number of results. I want to trigger this if it happens more than ten times, because maybe if there's a restart of the database, you might get a critical if there's something being written. Uh, how often do you want to run this? Maybe I want to run it every hour, once an hour. Uh, that's that's sufficient enough. I could, if this is a critical system, let's say this is a NASDAQ trading system where it's in in you know minutes, not hours, I can do that as well. So you have full flexibility. We also can go the other way. Let's say this is data that you want to watch and it's not, a, you know, the volume is pretty high and but it's not a critical system that you can check once a day. So I want to check it Monday at a certain time. Also, again, the results can be applied. The next part of this is I want to list, I want to go ahead and put a priority on this for severity. So this is possibly a critical issue with the DBA. I want to send it to a certain team, the DBA team, or better yet, I want to go ahead and run a script. And an example of this that I've been working on is creating a script on my local system that will consume a web service that's published from my service desk, in this case, Remedy, and go ahead and automatically create an incident. And there's a quite a few different examples of scripts on Splunk Base. Splunk Base is a great place to go take a look at Splunk Answers, and you'll provide a lot of developers have provided samples of this. We also can throttle this out. We can share it in the app. So this is a part of the core platform capability that immediately allows a customer to start leveraging this and being much more proactive in their monitoring. All right, so let's go back to the slides and we'll wrap up. So what about putting your thing about um, putting your machine data to work and back to that, you know, the question I asked you early on, those top two critical apps and the data that's missing for your team. Think about all of that data that's generated that they are dependent upon in some way, whether directly or indirectly, decisions that they need to make about assigning it and resolving it needs to come from that data. So how can we get to that data quickly? Well, one of the things you saw right out of the gate for Splunk is a search and investigation. To move to a proactive, we can very quickly move there with Splunk around search and investigation from day one. Splunk's in and we have customers using the free version today and then they find that they want to do more with it. So they actually put Splunk in place and have a, a license around that. So find and fix your problems dramatically faster. That has been the across the home plate core use case that has been used by all customers out there. But it doesn't stop there from day one. Now, customers implementing just for search and investigation can immediately move right into proactive monitoring. 
you know, correlation of multiple data sets and monitor for the issue that they couldn't do previously and start at least sending an email to someone when the event issue occurs. And I would even make the case in phase one, the customer we just finished implementing Splunk on with in their first use case, they are gaining valuable operational visibility of their critical uh, business system. In the case of this customer, it's their BPM system for processing financial payments. They were having a lot of latency issues. They are doing search investigation for performance coding issues monitoring for it and they now have dashboards as soon as you have dashboards you have operational visibility and oh by the way one thing i, I apologize i'm going to go back to the demo for just a second because this is the other part of that you gain with splunk that you as it can turn around and start to deliver valuable business insights whether it's to your management team to your internal customers or even to those outside of IT, Splunk can deliver valuable real-time insights. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me just go back for a second to my demo environment. And there was one I didn't get a chance to show you that I want to spend just a, a minute with. So the same data coming from this environment, this customer was able to take this data, this is IT data coming out of IT systems and provide a KPI, key performance indicators around the service related to financial. What's the in-flight transaction volume? What's the total average you know, basket for um, purchasing of different items for phones and those things that were in um, the devices that were in being purchased? What was successful purchase rate? What are the products that are currently being sold? We can take what's currently being sold put its price, which could come from an external database. This is valuable information that's, you know, sales, marketing, you know, there's some different ads they're going to push out. This is IT data that we can immediately turn back towards the business or what, what's going on with uh, current sales. So this is a use case that may be day one that you're able to get to, or definitely as customers grow with Splunk, they're able to turn this value data around because Splunk's mission is to make all machine data valuable and accessible to all users in the organization. So how do we connect this up with our service desk? And we'll just go back and review this. So in the case of Remedy, we could potentially for uh, end user support where they're having login issues, access issues, we could provide a Splunk dashboard where they can come in and put their name in, tell them where's the authentication issue, what did they at last access, what were their errors, and potentially resolve their issue much faster than we previously could. The other area is around tier two. So for the example of the PeopleSoft CI related to this, we can take them right to the dashboard around that critical business service or application. We also can provide access at the database or at this uh, CMDB layer around very specific CI. So it's what we call federation. And all CMDBs are capable of some level of federation, but oftentimes it's very challenging to implement federation and getting access to the data. Splunk makes it very easy to get access. We just simply have to create a federated link. So in this case here, I, I select the federated link and I'm looking at this database state for this you know, particular CI or it's the database or PeopleSoft, whatever it is. So we can allow someone at maybe a tier two or back end support or you know, system that administrator find that root cause issue much faster than they have previously and gain that operational visibility that they didn't have. So when Splunk is applied to MTTR, you see a benefit, benefit across the full spectrum of MTR and reducing it. And what we have found on average, starting around 40% and upwards towards 60 to 70% reduction in MTTR. Why? Because it plays a role, a key role in being proactive and identifying that. So you know not the what, but potentially the why, right immediately as that incident's reported. The meantime to know, as we've seen in this example and several different ones that we've gone through, it goes down. That 70% that we spend here normally, I can reduce that significantly. No more 3 a.m. SWAT call for having someone check an error log to figure out what's going on. And the meantime to fix is the ability to look at, well, that change was applied to that critical production system. I don't have access to production directly, but I do with Splunk. I can go and look at those files. I can look at the configuration. 
So it can be applied here as well. And we also can create artifacts out of Splunk. So if I find something that resolves my issue, I could potentially flag it or write it off into another index and becomes a knowledge artifact that could assist in future investigations. So from a single solution, we have the ability to deliver, I, I would say, three key aspects to IT operations. And it reaches across these, what I consider the use cases. The first one that we focused on in the demo was search and investigation. From day one of implementing Splunk, I have the ability to do log aggregation, search and investigate, and know why, what, and just dramatically resolve these issues. No more fun, you know, looking for that needle in haystack. It's already found because of Splunk. The other area is around operational visibility. Take your searches that you're creating and turn around and turn those into, you know, event correlations, live dashboards, uh, real-time proactive monitoring, looking at transaction levels, performance monitoring, all of these things that you wanted to do, but just didn't have the tools to do it. You can do it from a single platform. And then finally, Business insights, as I shared with you in that example in the demo, being able to turn around and take this data that's in IT. There's valuable insights there. In fact, the example from the, the Financial Institute that's implementing Splunk, they started seeing types of payments that were coming through this environment that they didn't see before. They actually could turn that into a dashboard and give it back to their financial analyst to see that data as their customers are making account deposits. So valuable information that potentially could be shared outside of IT. So the core platform is a development platform. I can take my searches, build them in the dashboards, put those into applications and deploy them out to my audience and in my organization. But the other thing I love about Splunk is there's so many applications that give me a head start. Many of these are free. So for example, the Microsoft app for, um, for Windows servers or for Unix and Nix servers, the ability to drop these in an environment and start monitoring and managing these environments and getting valuable insights or Microsoft Exchange, Active Directory. There's so many applications out here. I would encourage you if there's a specific application that you're looking for today that you're uh, trying to solve a data issue around, go and search. You'll find it there. The other thing in Splunk Base is around knowledge and the knowledge that's shared in a very robust, active community. Uh, Splunk Base is a place to spend time, especially if you're uh, new to Splunk. You'll find your answers are there in the Splunk Answers, as well as the apps that are shared in Splunk Base. So thinking back to that initial question, you know, your top tier apps and, you know, the data gaps your team are facing. What I would encourage you to do if you're new to Splunk is take some time to go ahead and download Splunk. You can get it off of our website if you go out to effecttech-operations.com. Try Splunk, it takes you over to the download, pick the version that's appropriate, put it on your desktop and begin Splunking that data. Start analyzing, well, how can you solve this issue? Or better yet, as I, I would still consider as option one, send me an email, let me set up a 60 minute call and we'll, I will walk you through, and enable you to begin getting that data out of your uh, log files. Just pick a couple sample log files, your production system, put on your desktop and let's start splunking those. I had a customer the other day and that's why I put it in here. They created a dashboard that solved the challenge that their manager had been looking to solve for a very long time. So you, at the end of the day, this person ended up being the IT hero and that you can as well. So uh, keep that in mind. Just send me an email as you're watching a replay of this webinar and I would be glad to go ahead and get started with you and help you uh, splunk your data. So thank you for your attending today. A couple of questions that were asked during this webinar that I just want to go back and share. One person asked about how hard is it to get the data in to the environment? Do I need any special programming skills? And what I love about Splunk is that it's very easy to get the data in. If it's a, let's say it's a Windows environment and you have a different directories for your log files, you simply install the forwarder, point to the directory, and tell it where to send the data. It's that fast in getting in. You don't have to do anything on that side to parse out the data or to transform it. You simply send it over to your indexer. And if it's a, it's a NIC server, you can begin listing your syslog feed off of that server, or just listing the different ports. So Splunk is very open in the way that it allows you to start collecting and bring that data, making it searchable. Next question comes from another person asking about, okay, I have security concerns, HIPAA compliance, and there's some sensitive data coming off of certain systems. How can Splunk protect that data? 
Well, a couple different ways. Uh, one, we can mask the data. So that is one thing on the forwarder side that we can tell the forwarder to go ahead and just go ahead and mask this data before you send it over. And it will no longer send across. Maybe you want a social security number. I want to send the last four. We can do that. The other way is if you want that data in, but you want to put security over the top of it, we can write the data off to its own unique index to where we'll have it off. Let's say security data goes into a very specific index for security. And then we would apply the appropriate permissions and roles and access to that data. So a couple different ways we can get to those in use cases. So thank you for joining me for this webinar today. And we look forward to uh, having you join us again in 2014 as we're going to be sharing more Splunk Insights. Thank you very much.